are told to work hard to become independent and successful in life, but we're also told to give joyfully and not to cling to the things we work so hard to get. God reminds us that everything is His. We are entrusted on this earth with time, talent, and treasure. In this podcast, we will learn to live as Jesus teaches. Welcome back to the Entrusted by God podcast. I'm Steve Wood. I'm the lead pastor at Mount Pisgah Methodist Church. And it's our joy today to be joined by Ray Bachman and Dwayne Wood as we continue our journey with Christ and our conversation about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus who's making disciples of Jesus and living life God's way, not just surviving, but living with contentment and grace and blessing and prosperity uh, in the Lord. Uh, we are keenly aware as we uh, have our conversation today of the grand opportunity God's given us uh, to live as stewards of all that God entrusts unto us. So today we're going to uh, kind of circle back around and talk about what is a constant human dilemma and certainly one that uh, pops up in different ways in our culture and around what it means to live a godly life and to do so with contentment versus what it means to kind of veer off the road and fall into greed, jealousy, selfishness, hoarding, and the like. So, Ray, you got a verse for us today. It's Paul's instructions to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. Yeah, let me read for you 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So there's a lot in here to unpack, but Dwayne, do you want to jump in and kick us off? Well, I look at this passage and I'm um, reminded of the fact that a lot of the guys that uh, uh, are in our social circles here or, you know, our, our spheres of influence uh, are people who for the most part, do not struggle financially very much at all. Right. But these warnings from Scripture uh, need to be heeded. And uh, I, I I hear a man tell me, oh, I'm comfortable with, and I'm like, time out. Hmm. God didn't call us to be comfortable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. it. He didn't call yeah. us to be comfortable. So that's not on the radar of objectives. Oh, I want to be comfortable. He called us to do work. And, uh, you know, that that's where I start with this and, and then just the focus on food and clothing as being the basic uh, necessities. And, you know, if you really can figure out how to focus on those things, mm-hmm. uh, it's amazing how life becomes Less complicated. Yeah. yeah but, but contentment is not necessarily throttling back and just chilling out and riding into the sunset. You can mm. still have a passion and desire to build whatever. That's right. And still have contentment and still have that godly approach. So I right. guess I just want to make that clear is that contentment, I mean, what's the old, what I've heard people say that um, poverty isn't necessarily spirituality or, or just sitting on the sidelines. Um, isn't what they're saying. They're saying God's got to be preeminent in whatever we do. Otherwise, it is greed. It's yeah. self-focused. It's yeah. it's us only. Uh, but Pastor Steve, what what are your thoughts? Well, it, it occurs to me that uh, we have a generational dynamic in this teaching. You've got Paul, who's already said in Philippians four, "Hey, I know what it is to live in plenty." 
and I know what it is to live in need, and I've learned to be content in all circumstances. He says that in Philippians 4, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the problem that we have in trying to keep this before us is that we often uh, lose sight of the fact of how simple life once was Mm -hmm. For many of us. And you don't have to be 70 years old to lose memory of that. Mm -hmm. You can be, uh, you know, 25, 30, 40 and realize the simplicity of how you grew up in a simple home with a simple uh, lifestyle and that kind of thing. The question is, I think what Paul's trying to do here with Timothy is he's trying to do a sticky teaching Mm -hmm. that everything we have is a resource engine to build the kingdom of God. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you've got land, property, money, knowledge, wisdom, influence, uh, whether by formal position and authority or informal, all of those things are to be used as a resource engine to build the kingdom of God. And so where we <laughs> where we plunge people into ruin and destruction, that's a sobering verse, mm. uh, it appears that the plunge occurs when we lose sight of the fact that this these things are entrusted unto us for a purpose. Mm. They're just not entrusted unto us as a reward for working hard, being smart, taking risk, or we're great people or whatever. The purpose is to build the kingdom of God. Yeah, in this verse, it says those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and in many foolish and harmful. The The point being is, is that shouldn't be the goal and objective. Now, God will allow us to have wealth, some of us more than others, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's our intent desire, that is a wrong desire. That's really greed, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, and I remember hearing the definition of where greed becomes unrighteous when it ignores God in our pursuits and it ignores ignores people in that pursuit. So, um, so God's got to be the ultimate reason of uh, that He gives us time, talent, treasures to utilize. If that's our goal and objective, as it says here, those who want to get rich, if that's the goal and objective, they're off course and they're going to be pulled into. All kinds of plunges. It says plunge people into ruin and destruction. How many people, especially we always read about and see the Hollywood stars, you know, that that acquire this great uh, mass of wealth and uh, properties or whatever. And what? They they, they wind up being destru- self-destructive almost. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> but again, the point being is where is your heart? You know, uh, you know, I, I always look at um, one of my heroes is um, the founder of Chick-fil-A. And um, he started out in just a little grill, just cooking sandwiches and things like that. And all of a sudden, God used him to build this a massive um, company that's probably one of the fastest growing fast food. But that wasn't his desire to be rich. His desire was to serve the Lord in his business. And he's touched many lives other than just selling chicken sandwiches. I mean, they have gotten involved in all kinds of ministry over the years. Right. But that wasn't his desire. But God allowed him to use him in that regard. And I think that's a perfect example of where God used riches in a positive way. And it was for God's glory. Yeah. You know? And true, true. Kathy yeah. is a person who, uh, never forgot the beauty of simplicity mm-hmm. of where his real riches mm-hmm. lie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, uh, not uh, opening on Sundays yeah. and giving the employees and the store and everything a day to rest to acknowledge the God. Matter of fact, I, my marketing professor in school was one of the consultants that mm. worked with Chick-fil-A and spent a lot of time. So we used to do a lot of case studies on Chick-fil-A, and this was in 19... 19- 80. It was before they started. Everybody now 
we have all these standalone stores. They were in the malls. That's where they were. Yeah, exactly. They that. didn't have any mall, standalone mall, yeah. stores, right. and they were this phenomenon. My my mother, uh, my she would take my grandmother to the mall because my <laughs> grandmother liked Chick Fil A, and yeah. you know it was like mm-hmm. this this chicken place is really good. You need to try this. <laughs> and uh, well, I say that because. Um, Apparently, when they were negotiating the leases in the early days, they were having to ask the mall provi- uh, uh, mm-hmm. mall owners to test them. They said, we will sell more product in six days than mm-hmm. all of our competitors will in seven days. Right. Mm-hmm. Test mm-hmm. us in this. Give us an opportunity, and we will prove it to you. Well, Long, you know, the, the story is that Chick Fil A became the darling. They're the highest per mm-hmm. uh, dollar per square yeah. foot for the the mall stores, and and retail rents is based on how much revenue you get. So that was a big deal for the for the uh, mall owners. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think I think there's many businesses and business owners that um, I I admire folks who, when God chooses to bless them and brings wealth to them, mm-hmm. and whether w- whether they earned it themselves or whatever the case may mm-hmm. be, the bottom line is God gave it to uh-huh. them. God gave them the ability to earn it. God put them in the situation. Uh, it's really neat to me when I see people who um, continue to live modestly and to give generously when they have a, an abundance. Now, that's someone who's probably not striving to get rich. Right. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I run into a lot of people, have in my career in commercial real estate, I run into a lot of people who just want to double down, double down, take mm-hmm. risk, mm-hmm. and are trying to get rich, mm-hmm. trying mm-hmm. to get rich. Right. And, you know, uh, I, I, it's just a different way. It's a different way of looking at yeah, things. Yeah, so the contentment factor, I'll never forget, by the way, True Kathy came here to Mount Pisgah oh, wow. in 2010, spoke to a gathering we had as we launched the Mount Pisgah Foundation. And uh, the one thing I noticed about him was there seemed to be absolutely no absence of joy and contentment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he, you know, he lived his life for the Lord. Mm-hmm. He made no bones about it. He stuck to his guns, regardless of what the culture may think about it, in terms of his faith, the company's faith statement, and uh, then, of course, keeping the Sabbath. And so, the uh, you know, as opposed to, there's a lot wealthier people, I'm sure, sure. But I'm not sure the contentment scale for them is very high. I remember when um, we we sent Christy, our daughter, to um, Kent Windshape, which he had um, at the campus in Rome. During yeah, the Barry College. Yeah, and I remember he spoke spoke one Sunday at the end of the the uh, summer camp, and he used the expression or the acrostic joy. He said, um, you know. I've found true joy in my business life and my marriage and my family. And he said, joy stands for Jesus, others, then you in that sequence. And I really believe God honored him because he put Jesus first, then others, then himself. And uh, you're right. That's where contentment comes from. Because, again, what are people looking for? They're looking to fill that void in their lives um, with everything but Christ, you yeah. know, whether it be relationships or stuff or wealth or whatever circumstances they're trying to fill that. And I remember um, this is still, you know, this isn't off tra- track, but um, we've all heard of um, the song. It is well with my soul. Right. The old hymn. Yeah. And you may know the story pastor better than I do, but my understanding was, is there's a man, I don't know if he was a 17 or 1800s that had come to the States. Yeah. Had his family come over from England. H.G. Spafford. And yeah. the ship, I think it was his wife and five children. Right. You know the story? Yeah. Okay. Well, well he, it went down. It went yeah, down. Doing great. And he, Keep lo- going. Then he didn't he lose his wife and all his children? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, 
And so apparently uh, months after that, he made the trip back. And apparently where they thought that ship went down is when God really stirred his heart. And he wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Right. I mean, can you imagine having lost your family and have be the ability to, to to be able to even pen the words, It Is Well With My That is a person that found contentment with God even in the most difficult parts of his life. And I think... That's what God's called us to, no matter whether things are great or terrible or frustrating or or challenging. He wants us to have that contentment, and it can only come from him, because otherwise the circumstances will take us out <laughs> yeah. in a heartbeat. Um, yeah. But anyway, I'm just reminded of that particular story. It's like, oh, my goodness, that has to be a God incident where God just fills you with that contentment, because humanly it's not possible. That's powerful. You know? Yeah, remember we talked about this, but contentment is learned, as Paul tells us. And let's see if I can remember this. We talked about uh, trusting God, thanking God, uh, loving others more than things, loving people and not things, mm-hmm. and being generous, mm-hmm. being being very generous. Mm-hmm. Each one of those things, if we practice those, if we do that— then uh, we will learn contentment, as Paul did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what? It it just occurs to me that a lot of times we make the mistake of doing two things. We lose sight of the why, mm. why we exist, what our purpose is, uh, you know, to bring God glory and to enjoy on a relationship with God, but to build the kingdom of God. And then the other thing that is problematic that con- contributes to a lot of misery and misdirection is uh, simply we fail to keep before us the greater purpose by which God has blessed us. Mm-hmm. And so in Hebrews 13 it doesn't say keep your life uh, free from money. It says keep your lives free from the love of mm. money and be content with what you have. So the safety net, the bedrock, the fallback, the promise, I got you, comes from a relationship with Christ and a God who says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, Hey, I've numbered the hairs of your head. I'm going to take care of you. That's the source of security, not anything this world has to offer. And I think I think contentment <clears throat> has has some components. I think it's got to be something that we have to we make a choice to be content. And I think it's something it's a learned pattern of life where we say, "Okay, these are the guardrails I've put up so that I can live content in, you know, um, that I can live um, just comfortable and not and not look around. In, in other words, comparison is such a dangerous um, aspect in all this because when we look around, all of a sudden we realize what we don't have, and that disrupts again. If our if our if our con- uh, contentment is based on circumstances, situations, it will always struggle will always struggle but if we defined the parameters of our contentment i think it keeps that that life in a more comfortable balanced way otherwise we're on the roller coaster there's always every commercial that comes on what they're trying to disrupt our contentment <laughs> you're not happy unless you have this unless you go here unless you acquire this I mean, the world is set up to dis- to disrupt our cont- uh, our contentment. Com- comparison is the world's exactly. way to sow discontentment, mm-hmm. to sow evil, mm-hmm. because it separates and divides people. Mm. It really does. There's there. I, I like to say there's two kinds of people on this earth. There's God's sheep and there's goats, yeah. saved and lost, mm-hmm. and. That's got nothing to do with skin color. Mm-hmm. It's got nothing to do with economic background. Right. It's got nothing to do with educational nation, where you're from. There's two kinds of people. There's saved and lost people. Mm-hmm. And we hug those who are saved as a body, and we minister to those 
who are the lost and spread the good news. Mm -hmm. In the days ahead, we'll talk about some of the sources of discontentment. But uh, it's a good it's a good place for us to wind up the podcast today and just acknowledge that contentment doesn't find us in a random way. Uh, it is a fruit of a relationship with Jesus Christ that's alive and well, that goes through the ups and downs of life so that we're content with a God who loves us, never leaves us nor forsakes us, and, you know, uh, assets and net worth and everything else may come and go and be seasonal and cyclical and so on and so forth, but the love of God remains. We pray that over you today. We're so grateful for you joining us on the podcast. If we can be helpful to you, you're welcome to reach out to us at Mount org, And until we meet again, God bless you. And may the Lord's contentment be upon you as you seek his heart. Join us next time as we continue to learn to live with open hearts and open hands as followers of Jesus Christ. 